So now we come to our second panel, which will cover the roles that women leaders can play and how they can break barriers. This panel will be moderated by Michael Jenkins, who's the CEO of Expert Humans. And the panelists will be Mohammed Nasiri with APEC UN Women, Renee McGowan with Mercer, Sergit Mishra with Aditya Birla Group, Farhan Syed with KPMG United Arab Emirates, Sanjeev Chatra, a global executive and business leader, and Deepala Khanna with the Rockefeller Foundation. Mr. Jenkins, please begin your panel session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mike, and uh, a warm welcome from all of us to the audience. And of course, a very warm welcome to our wonderful panel uh, that we have assembled uh, here today. So we're here to talk about uh, breaking barriers and what, what role could, can women leaders play in this? Uh, I just wanted to say a few, few uh, uh, things before we start. Um, I think we're coming together today at uh, a time when our world is going through unprecedented and rapid change uh, caused by what we might call uh, the great disruptors of our times. Uh, and these include, amongst other things, global health challenges, uh, digital transformation, of course, sustainability challenges, um, something that I'm interested in, which is the, the erosion of trust in organizations. And of course, last but not least, the question of inequality and inequality of all kinds. And so what we're seeing is a, a perfect storm in some ways of all of these disruptors coming together uh, to put our world, our people and our ecosystems uh, at tremendous risk. Now, one of the disruptors, of course, that we'll be focusing on in our panel discussion today is, is inequality, but I'm sure we'll be touching on some of those other disruptors that I've mentioned as well. Um, now, some of the key aspects of the discussion will also be around uh, topics uh, like uh, leading by example and spearheading uh, changes in the organization. We'll be looking at what will it take to bring in uh, an inclusive leadership and what would be its effect on decision making. And then last but not least, looking at ensuring that work from home, uh, work near home culture doesn't leave women behind. And so before we get started, we would love to invite the audience to take part in a very, very quick poll. And we have a, a poll question for you, and I'll, I'll just see if um, um, our friends uh, backstage are able to pull the poll up for us. Uh, would that would that be possible, uh, Faiz? Um, so we, we have a, a poll question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what the poll question is in just a moment. Um, and what we'll be asking you is of, of a number of options, what do you think could be the key factor in enabling women leaders to play a role in breaking barriers? And we'll be asking you to just select one of the factors that we'll be showing you in just a moment. So let's just see if uh, Fiz is able to bring up the, bring up the poll. So the poll, the poll is live. Um, Fais, are we able to see it ourselves on screen? Okay. So the questions that we have for our audience is, um, do you see uh, the following as the most important things? So challenging current assumptions about what constitutes leadership. Um, championing women leaders as role models, conducting more diversity and inclusion programs, calling out and tackling systemic issues in organizations, cultivating compassion and empathy at work, or perhaps other factors. So I will be able to, mess, I will be able to uh, share the results of the poll with you guys in just a moment, uh, as they will be sent to me in the, in the chat. So just a, a second while we get that data. So just a gentle reminder, challenging con current assumptions about what constitutes leadership, championing women leaders as role models, 
conducting more diversity and inclusion programs, calling out and tackling systemic issues in organizations, and cultivating compassion and empathy at work. And we've also said other factors could be, could be at play as well. So challenging current assumptions about what constitutes leadership, 28.6%. Championing women leaders as role models, 24.8% conducting more diversity and inclusion programs, 13.3%, calling out and tackling systemic issues in organizations, 20%, and cultivating compassion and empathy at work, 11.6%. And I'm sure there'll be some other items as well. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to see that uh, championing women leaders as role models and also challenging current assumptions about what constitutes leadership uh, seem to be um, very much uh, uh, on the top of everybody's minds. So very interesting. And uh, in third place, calling out and tackling systemic issues in organizations. So very interesting. Thank you very much to the audience uh, for uh, indulging us in that, uh, in that uh, poll. Thank you so much. So. What I'd like to do next is to move um, swiftly to our uh, panel and uh, we'll be hearing from three of the members of the panel initially and then we'll be doing a little bit of a pause just to reflect on what we've heard and then we'll mo be moving to the second three members of the panel. So first I'd like to turn to Mohammed, if I may Mohammed, and uh, invite you to say a few words about what's on your mind and what you'd like to share with us today. Mohammed, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you for starting with engaging the audience. I'm very, very grateful to, to be here with you today. This is actually my first thought. Um, but um, some, of, some of the thoughts on this, that organizations really should reflect the communities and populations they serve, uh, full stop. Uh, this is why decision makers must examine the composition of their organizations and ensure that they are actively allowing for marginalized voices to be heard. Um, as a director of UN Women in Asia and the Pacific myself, it's uh, an immense privilege to support the UN at large in its efforts to achieve gender parity. As part of a holistic approach uh, to equity, UN Women is committed to creating an inclusive work environment by fostering diversity and equality as a central component of its work culture, opening doors for women and elevating their voices. Indeed, we see it as our responsibility to set the standards for inclusive and progressive practices among all of us, our partners, and our member states. It's exciting to see how the worldwide conversation is progressing towards ensuring the realization of this same dream. This was more or less not uh, talking about before COVID. It has never been so important to include voices that have been absent from the discussion as it is right now. Uh, fostering a culture of inclusion isn't just nice to have, it is essential. Um, every single study that has been done about the subject has shown that it directly improves performance. A culture of inclusive leadership means taking steps to strengthen social protection systems for women working to ensure their safety, it includes gender-specific policies and actions, such as maternity leave and childcare for women, whether or not they are working from home. This also means providing strong mentorship for women, especially those who are beginning new careers. And especially in light of the increased care burdens associated with COVID, it means that leaders must consider flexible working arrangements and hours to help women cope with the increased responsibility of care due to continued school and daycare closures. It is within all of us to make a difference in ensuring a culture of gender, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. We must all participate in this effort. We must, however, act upon our words and take responsibility for ourselves in order to effect real change. Culture is primarily change through day-to-day -day work at the ground level. Leaders must learn new approaches, take risks, and experiment to create a different type of organization. These are my thoughts today, Mike, and in summary, we must be the change we wish to see. Thank you and back to you. 
Lovely, Mohammed. Thank you very much. What's echoing for me is um, I love that fact that you said we, we must allow those disadvantaged uh, voices to be heard. I think that's a really such an important message, isn't it? And and new approaches as well. So, so important. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks very much. And with that, um, may I now turn to uh, Deepali and uh, invite you to share a few words with us, uh, Deepali, and, and over to you. Thanks, Michael. And I'm really humbled to be amidst leaders from different walks of life. And to really have this opportunity to, to talk, be talking about breaking barriers in the role of women leaders, given that I'm actively learning each day to be a better leader in this sector, not just as a woman leader, but truly a leader. And I really hope to learn so much more through the conversation today. I'd like to discuss learning by example from two vantage points. First, I want to look at it through my own personal experience in leading roles in the development sector. And second, from the perspective of the influence and power of philanthropies in advancing women leaders and in investing in gender-focused programs. I know Mohammed's touched on some of them, so there may be a little bit of repetition there, um, but I would see it more as a reinforcement. So let's start with my personal experience as a leader in the development sector. Uh, recognizing that women are the key cogs in the machinery that is family, society, nation, the economy, or for that matter, any system, it is really imperative that we develop women leaders. In my experience, leading organizations working for and with the Global South, I know that women leaders are instrumental in bringing about social change or what we call development. They have been mothers who kept family units intact, tribal leaders, health workers, bureaucrats in key ministries, and women leaders in political parties, just to mention a few. Mm. Women leaders in the development sector are distinctly positioned to design women-friendly programs. The entire development community has, for the past many decades, focused on women on the ground as their primary clients. I'm getting a lot of echo. Are you guys also getting that echo, or is it just me? Can, can you all hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, so it is widely understood that when we invested in women leaders in the field, societies prospered and benefits reached all. But why did this happen? Earlier, 70% of the international NGO staff, for example, were women. They brought their personal experience as, and perspectives to the fore in their solutioning processes, and they were empowering other women. And the results are widely known to us all. These inter interventions worked. Unfortunately, this did not translate into more women leaders in senior positions. Even though 70% women were working in the sector, less than 30% are really in leadership roles in the international NGO space. It's about 12 to 14% in the United States and 24% of the top 100 nonprofits in the UK. There are unique challenges women face in the social sector workplace. The statistics do not even begin to take into account a number of unique challenges that women face in the workplace that serve as hurdles in their professional path, such as pay disparity, returning to the workforce post-childbirth, safety while working in high-risk areas, lack of investor trust, and so on. So regardless of whether a woman is a social or a business entrepreneur, she has to negotiate through an ecosystem that has traditionally been structured for men to succeed. Now, coming to my second point or reflection is that all organizations in whatever field they operate in, they need to encourage and promote women leadership. It can't just happen by the way. There has to be a clear strategic impetus to make that happen. We are seeing it work in the philanthropy sector for sure, and this is where I am, so I'm speaking from my own experience. As a philanthropic organization, we are working with a range of organizations and partners and I'm seeing that some, still not many, of our partners or grantees are successfully led by women. They are all extremely talented, experienced women who bring the best of their abilities to their jobs and ensure that true impact is delivered. We know that gender needs to be at the heart of all development efforts due, its, due to its multiplier effect. The global movement for gender equality is at an historic inflection point, and we can certainly accelerate it to substantial scale. 2020 marked 25 years since the Beijing conference and nine years 
until the deadline for achieving the SDGs in 2030. Concerted measures are especially needed where gendered barriers intersect with other factors of discrimination, such as class, race, caste, ethnicity, sexual identity, disability, and other social contextual factors to curtail opportunity. Some of the ways we are trying to do it is to be working with our core partner, CoImpact, at its recently launched Gender Fund, we are making bold commitments to advance women's leadership and towards gender equitable services at scale. In our global commitment to ending energy poverty, especially post the coronavirus epidemic, we are working to harness the power that can lead to a more equitable, safer world for women. Women can help in shaping the renewable energy value chain and can help in better design, produce, distribute, and the sales of sustainable technologies. Globally, we've committed over $100 million to expand precision public health, to use predictive analytics to prevent rather than respond to health threats and leverages big data on the social determinants of health, starting with women and children's health. I want to end by saying that there needs to be a significant commitment of resources to address systemic barriers to ensure women and girls' advancement. Philanthropy and other stakeholders can and should collaborate to redress entrenched discrimination by keeping women and their well-being at the center of all that we do. Dipali, thank you so much. A, a wealth of... Uh of uh, insight and information there. Um, really, really wonderful to hear all of those things. I was um, struck by your opening uh, comment about women really being the cogs uh, in, the, in the system, if you like, um, at playing that absolutely critical role. Um, you flagged up systemic issues as well, which is mirrored, I think, by some of the uh, results we saw in the poll earlier. Um, and I, I love the fact that you're also able to link um, uh, all of this to the role that women leaders can play, for example, in the uh, renewable energy value chain, which is, I think, these things, these connections that we that we make are so important. And also, you flagged up the importance of partners, I think, which is such an important aspect too. We can't do this by ourselves. We have to work together to, to advance the cause, as it were. So thank you so much, Dupali. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely. Well, let me move now to Srijit Mishra, um, who is uh, joining us. Uh, Srijit, um, welcome and um, uh, congratulations on sharing the uh, 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 article yesterday uh, through LinkedIn. Very, very interesting indeed. So over to you, sir. <clears throat> well, uh, precisely, Michael, what's going on in my mind. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Rene, uh, Farhan, Sanjeev and Dipali, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you on the panel. Uh, a few thoughts are going on in my mind. Uh, diversity is not just about what you see. It is what you think, it's what you feel, and how you act. It is well beyond just demographics. It's well beyond what you just see. That's the first thing that's coming to my mind. The second thing, and, I, and, and the previous discussion, I overheard the previous discussion, the pandemic has really amplified the need to reimagine our DEI aspect, particularly the disproportionate burden that's come on women, and they're carrying on with the onset of the, the whole COVID uh, piece, uh, you know, we know schooling is happening. We know there is work. There is, there is, uh, there is nothing called nine to five anymore. You know, one of the things that's gone out of the window with, with this whole work from home is, you know, you can meet for anything at any time. So there are lots of additional burden on women. Uh, thirdly, there are barriers in workplace, which are both seen and unseen. Uh, some are obvious ones. Some of them we've already talked about. Glass ceiling for women, glass walls, gender, gender stereotypic roles. But there are many unseen pieces as well that communicate a mismatch between how women are seen and the qualities and experiences people tend to associate with, with leaders. That's a third thought. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that the poll says challenging current assumptions on leadership is the highest piece that you should be heard. And then looking at this, uh, looking at, uh, um, you know, uh, promoting women uh, 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 as an agenda and looking at systemic issues in the organization. Let me take a few examples that are going in my mind. Uh, while we associate charisma and confidence with leadership skills, perhaps it is competence, humility, and integrity that makes a leader more effective. 
uh, women score much higher on the, these attributes uh, of competence, humility, and integrity in my experience in my lifetime. Perhaps we must start addressing such conventions that communicate a mismatch. Becoming a leader uh, involves much more than being just put in a leadership role. Acquiring new skills or adapting to one style to the requirements of the role. It may require an identity switch in the organization that is easier for a woman to do. Men doff, many or very often have found this difficult. There are other things that are going on in my mind. Often I wonder when a new talent enters an organization, our thinkings are diverse, right? Um, but something happens in that first one year, two years, at the, at the end of those two years, everybody is talking and behaving in the same way. Now, we have to be careful about what's culture and how do we allow diversity to work. And I think, first of all, accepting the fact that it helps an organization, helps well serving the needs of the society better to start with, is the way to begin. And I think hiring for attitude and values, not just for skills and behavior, will make a big difference to the way we look at women in the workplace. Trust me, I am proud to have two of my leadership team, 40% of my leadership team are women, and they handle the two biggest parts of consumer customer think and driving businesses sustainably for the future. Proud to be here. Yes, work from home is important and we must start looking at people, not as women or men, but as people at different stages in life with different ambitions, with different needs, with different purpose. So DEI, I'm afraid for all HR employees, has to be personalized to an individual and more so for women during this time. Those are my thoughts that are going on in my head. Thank you very much. Sriji, thank you so much. Uh, some great thoughts there. And I think um, uh, there are members of the audience. Maureen is one who, who said, like me, I love the way you said that you really feel that uh, diversity is how you feel and how you act as well. So it's an absolutely uh, a super comment. You pointed out the COVID effect as well, which was um, echoing some of the sharing that we had from Vinika Rao earlier today. And um, I also love the competence, humility, and also integrity. That's what we're looking for in leadership as well. And uh, uh, last but not least, hiring for attitude and values as well. Some really, really good messages, I think. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Shuji, for sharing with us. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you, you're most welcome. I'm aware of the time and the fact that uh, we started a little bit later. So what I'm going to do is um, continue to invite uh, comments in the chat from the audience, and we'll weave those in as we go. Um, I think if, um, if our panel members are okay, I'd, I'd like to actually proceed with the panel members too, because um, I, I want to be absolutely sure that um, all of you have an opportunity to um, take, take sufficient time to share your, your thoughts with us. And so um, with that in mind, um, Sanjeev, I'm putting you on the spot because you were not expecting to speak quite so soon, but I'd like to come to you now and give you an opportunity to, to share with us, and then I'll be coming to Rene after that. So, Sanjeev, over to you. A very warm welcome as well. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, firstly, I want to just congratulate AWLS for putting together this outstanding conference. Great, great lineup, and I, I think it's really commendable that in spite of all of the challenges we've had, we are still able to get together uh, in a virtual way. Uh, I think those are also some of the pluses of technology that some of the people have talked about earlier. So as, as I reflect upon, I think, uh, I mean, some of the discussions that have happened both in this panel and also the, the preceding ones, I've, I just can't help but think that it's really important for us to continue to reinforce the why behind diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think too often people still continue to use either the narrative, uh, and I hope that's not I mean, very deeply rooted in terms of the belief system around why it is a good thing to do as if it's a more charitable thing to do. Uh, I, I, I think there's enough research that has been done on this particular topic, but it's worth reinforcing that there is a very, very strong commercial business reason on why you want diversity. Um, and I, I think, it is still not landing very well, and particularly with a lot of the senior people who've got influence within the organizations. Uh, with the result, I think what does happen is a little bit of a check mark, and people still continue to do more of the same. Um, if, 
I mean, there, there is search, and I think Dr. Vinika Rao spoke about some earlier, but I mean, IMF has done it, World Economic Forum has done it, and there's tons of material which kind of has demonstrated that if you want to attract, nurture, build a high-performing team, you want to have cognitive diversity, which was, I think, the point that Shriji was also making earlier, that you cannot have group thing because you're not serving customers who are exactly the same. It also creates for a better work environment to have different levels of ability and resilience uh, within the team uh, to be able to think differently, um, which leads to better performing team by the organizations. So I just put that out there first. I think this pandemic has given us a tremendous opportunity, uh, much that it may not feel sometimes when we are all locked up inside our homes, to, to build back better, but build back better in a different manner to how it has been in the past. Um, and while there are opportunities, I'm also very, very conscious that there is a very big risk that we'll actually regress back. And I think some of the data that's been shared earlier is, is quite sobering that we continue to have 100 plus years to get to parity and there's more and more uh, new issues that continue to surface. We kind of have always known that in patriarchal societies uh, that many of us are living in, uh, women tend to be time poor. And hence, I think it's incumbent on men to lean in and do their part, not just at work, but also at home, to create a bit more of a balance. Um, I think only through doing that, you're going to create the capacity to be able to get the, the best and harness the best out of everybody, not just with the men, but also with the women. Uh, on, on women's part, I think there's also an opportunity to reimagine the future of work in a bit different manner. And clearly, with, with the amount of technology being used, I think digital dexterity becomes more and more important. Uh, having worked in financial services and technology companies most of my, my career, I'm very acutely aware that while the, the pipeline as it comes in, um, and if I think back to my school days, I think women were, if not at par, they were ahead of the men in terms of academic performance, does fall away very, very quickly. So clearly is not linked to ability, but there's something else that happens systematically, which turns women away from technology. Um, I think it's very important for women to feel excited again about technology um, so that they can contribute in a new digital world even more effectively. So I would strongly encourage for a lot of women and particularly women leaders to embrace technology um, very, very aggressively because that can potentially provide you with an opportunity to disrupt um, a lot of the male bastions that have kind of existed in many uh, corporate organizations. The last thought I'll, I'll leave with is, is really for the men. I think there is uh, a lot of opportunity for men to call out uh, behaviors which, which are perhaps not appropriate and, and too often you continue to see toxic masculinity still uh, fairly prevalent in many organizations. This week in, in Asia, we, we've had a very notable case that has been reported quite a lot. Uh, it's really important that we reflect on what kind of people we want to be. And a quote that was used earlier, which was a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which was about, be the change you want to see in others, I think is a very appropriate one. Because we need to reflect on what kind of environment we want our children, our, our family members to be growing. What, what is the legacy that we are leaving behind? And hence, you should challenge uh, wrong behavior. You should also embrace uh, diverse views because it will help you to grow, uh, which was the point that was made by the first speaker about resilience. If you really want to, to grow, you've got to get into a little bit more of the uncomfortable territory of your performance which may mean at times having um, self-doubts, uh, which may mean I'm mean, listening to people who have got a very diverse view to what you have. But as long as you are aligned to the purpose of the organization and you're going in the same direction, I think you're going to come out much, much stronger. Uh, one of the things that uh, one of the panelists in the subsequent panel are going to talk about April uh, is an initiative we've started recently in Singapore uh, called Nine by Nine which is an NGO that April um, and Christian Fellows have, have formed over here, which is very actively working towards identifying what are those nine actionable things that we can achieve to get to gender parity uh, by 2030, uh, which is the, the UNSDG goal. Uh, I'm very excited about what that's going to, to unpack 
uh, and I'm sure April is going to talk about that in the later panel also, but I wanted to plug that here because all of us have uh, a sphere of influence in which we can try and create that change. And whatever be that sphere of influence, whether it's one person or a hundred people, I think as long as you are making a positive impact, you are helping to contribute to a better legacy than what we've inherited. Sanjeev, thank you so much. That was um, that was really very helpful. Um, thank you for for reinforcing, you know, that we we need to be asking about the why. Um, that was, I think, for me, a really important point, a, a great reminder. The business imperative, the importance of cognitive diversity. You flagged also uh, women and tech, for instance, for instance, which is, I think, a very, very important point. And I think as a lovely compliment to what we heard, heard earlier about the importance of partners, you also talked about using our spheres of influence to enable change to happen. So these are, are, are really, really strong messages. And the last thing I'd mention is um, that point you made about men and uh, men leaning in, especially at home. So I think that's a really good thing to have shared with us, Sanjeev. So thank you so much for your for your comments. And with that, thank you, Sanjeev. I'm going to turn to uh, uh, Rene and uh, invite Rene to share her thoughts with us. Rene, um, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you for everybody that's joined today. Um, I'd like to echo Sanjeev's um, congratulations to AWLS for continuing um, to host its type of forum, which is, is so important. I very much hope and look forward to perhaps next year being in, in person because, of course, the value of that is that um, we get to support each other uh, in, in building more networks. Um, so there's always many things on my mind, but for the topic of, of today, uh, it really is around um, inclusive leadership and, of course, uh, women, uh, given the, the forum that we're in. Um, you know, inclusive leadership is, you know, a management term that is, has got an enormous amount of, of traction um, and it's a, a trait there. But I think for me, um, inclusive leadership is another example of a trend that has really been accelerated by the pandemic. And that's a bit of what I'll, I'll talk about today. How has the pandemic accelerated some of the changes that we have, um, both for the positive and the negative? So um, the concept of inclusive leadership and making people uh, welcome and making diverse opinions, thoughts, um, et cetera, heard has been around for, for many times. Um, a really good sort of six traits that were um, resonated with me was Harvard Business Review back in 2019. Um, they identified six traits through their research of an inclusive leader. Um, they were visible commitment, humility, awareness of bias, curiosity about others, cultural intelligence, and effective collaboration. And when you run through those, you realise that they are all the types of traits that we are really talking about now and, the, and that the pandemic has probably accelerated the demand for those in workplaces and for us to have them as leaders. And so the pandemic for me is sort of, been, you know, an ultimate test of leadership, uh, if you like, and how that we can provide the empathy and the adaptability and also the collaboration to make sure that everybody uh, in the workplace or everybody in our society uh, can fare well. And as we've heard from other panellists, you know, there are a lot of threats with that. From an organisational perspective, one of the things for me is, you know, that we started to see, I think, really quite quickly is this moving from taking charge to taking care in the workplace. And as we move from, you know, a, a style of taking charge to taking care, what we're doing hopefully is creating, you know, psychological safety uh, there for people as well. People feel trusted and secure and then they're, you know, more inclined to, to bring their full self uh, to the work and to the job and, and so on, but also more inclined to take the right risks uh, and to, to strive for innovation. Um, so they're all the, the things that are on my mind around inclusive leadership, um, how the pandemic has accelerated the need for it, as one of our, our other panellists said, made it a necessity, if you like. One of the pieces that's on my mind that's probably a little bit more troubling is to make sure that the impact of the pandemic doesn't inadvertently really negatively impact the progress that we've made with women um, and girls uh, and, and gender in, in general. 
So I think we've seen that COVID has accelerated some inequalities that are there for our most vulnerable. Um, we see that with regards to women, uh, with elderly, with gig workers in the, in the workplace as well. Um, and we also see that the shifts in the way that we're working um, is also having an impact there and actually could um, create further inequity. And that's something that I wanted to call out today because I think it's an important thing for all of us as leaders and all of us, you know, working in, in firms, be they for-profit, not-for-profit and, and so on, is that we really need to make sure that we're creating an environment um, and being really alert to making sure that inequities don't get worse and that we don't turn back some of the progress that has been made over recent decades. Um, that probably starts with schooling. Um, you know, Merce has been very concerned to watch the number of girls who uh, will not return to school after a pandemic or have not had access to online education. And it flows through to the workplace in terms of is flexibility actually providing a better outcome for women and being aware of the fact that um, it may be putting more of a burden on women with regards to uh, their home management and also may create a challenge that they're less visible uh, in the workplace as well. Um, so some things there that I think are changing really rapidly, but some opportunities uh, for all of us, no, no matter what sphere of domain we're in, to make a real impact by being alert to them, I think, and being very proactive. Renee, thank you so much. And um, what, what's resonating hugely for me is, you know, with the, the pandemic has caused so many ripple effects, and I think we're, we're going to be feeling these for many years to come. I think your message about let's do all that we can to be as alert as we can be to make sure that we do not lose um, any of the progress that we've made as you so quietly quite rightly said over the past decades thank you for referencing those um, six traits from the harvard business review really good i think everyone will sort of be going over to that to have a reread of that because i think it's a, it's a really really hugely important um contribution there and the thing that i also love that you said was that you introduced empathy into the conversation as well, which I think is something that is is growing in intensity. And I, I was very pleased to see that um, over 10% of the audience said that compassion and empathy was something that we needed to dial up uh, earlier. And also being alive to the shifts in the nature of work as well going forward. And what will that mean for women um, and uh, for gender equality going forward? So Renee, some really powerful messages there. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, with uh, after Rene, we, we, we're delighted to um, uh, invite uh, Farhan to take the floor and to share some thoughts with us. So Farhan, over to you, and thank you so much for, for, for being the last person to, to, to take the stage, as it were. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Michael. And um, again, like my other peers as well, a uh, big kudos and congratulations to AWLS. Uh, I was actually reflecting on this discussion. I was, I did also attend a couple of sessions before, and I wanted to share with the audience a slightly different uh, perspective. My humble opinion is that by the time um, you know we talk about uh, diversity and inclusivity at the workplace and in the corporate world, it is probably too late. I think we all have responsibility, not only as leaders, but most importantly, first as parents, because a lot of the issues that we are facing is actually the social conditioning that our children go through in their early stages of their life. And I personally feel, you know, and this is my personal observation and opinion that um, we as parents particularly are a little bit more protective about uh, our daughters. And that uh, becomes an issue at times. And I'll give you a personal example. Just the other day, you know, we were sitting at home and I was watching the Premier League. And my daughter, who's, uh, who's about four years old now, uh, was uh, asking us and my wife was sitting next to me to say, you know, what is this sport? And, you know, why can't I also go and play this? And without even realizing, you know, my, my, my better half is encouraging her. And she made a comment to say, you know, this is a, this is a sport for the boys. And I think this is a very small example, but it was quite telling as to how the issues that we face in our workplace, it really could be addressed if we start being a little bit more careful and mindful of how we actually bring up our children at home. And I personally think it is just many, many examples come to my mind 
where we have challenges where as parents are desired to be protective about our daughters may sometimes becomes an issue as we are socially conditioning them because we naturally start limiting the choices for them the options for them you know probably you can't go out at this time of the day or you can't go out at this time of the evening you could go here and you can't go here without even them exploring whether they are good at one particular thing or not we have limited them and by the time they you know grow up through the system and come into the workforce in my humble opinion is actually too late so yes we need to address these issues of not stereotyping and biases and a number of other challenges that we have and recognizing the responsibility that our female and colleagues have i think my recommendation is that it actually really starts at home and we need to be ultra careful of how we bring up our our children and how do we expose them to equal opportunities uh, and not get biased as parents Sorry, Mike. Like, yes, yes, indeed, Farhan. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, for sharing. Um, you know what you were saying. I think is echoing with many members of the audience, and I, I can see Pamela uh, Pamela Ong is uh, agreeing wholeheartedly with you. Pamela had earlier made the, the the point. We need to change the conversation earlier, and that's exactly I think Farhan. What you're saying is that those conversations that happen in the home is where we have to start uh, making sure that we, we're not actually seeding, seeding the, uh, the bias that uh, we're going to have to tackle later in, in, the, in the life of a person uh, and, and perpetuate, if you like, uh, the cycle. So I think your contribution was um, really, really super. Thank you, thank you for, for, those, for those lovely examples as well. Um, so many thanks to you. Great. Well, th thank you, everybody, for um, contributing. And um, this is an opportunity now for us to uh, look at some of the questions that have come up from the audience. I'd like to deal with those very uh, uh, right now. Um, Pooja, earlier on, um, had a question which um, um, she was, I think, interested to pose to um, Srijit. And Srijit, this was around how do we change the old ways of working? Because that seems to be like a, a bottleneck. Any thoughts on that? And I know that's a huge question. And then I'll invite the, the members of the panel then to, to sort of jump in after you with their thoughts as well. How do we change these, these old ways and these, these, these systematic barriers? I, I, um, it's a great question. I think, let me start by saying that uh, in, my, in my experience, when you are focused on an issue, and if you're focused on, let's say, a consumer customer, way of thinking, or if you're focused on uh, driving businesses sustainably, and both these kind of are two solid pillars that actually take businesses forward. If you focus not on the person, but on the issue at hand from a consumer customer lens or from a sustainability end, you will find most people over a period of time will come down to your point of view. Okay. Um, the second thing is when you carry uh, there is a very big value of experience, okay? There's a big value of experience. Um, but there is a big value of naivety too. I mean, I often tell my team that, you know, there must be, you cannot have everybody as forwards in your team. Yeah? You've got to have a role for a goalkeeper and a center forward. And you must give that same respect to each of these individuals. Um, and I'm saying, when you create experience as a big thing that can either be a positive thing for you or a detriment for the future. And we heard, uh, you know, uh, Sanjeev talk about digital. Digital is a great uh, way of, um, should I say, balancing out things for, for people. It, it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's man or woman or a young kid or, a, or an older person. It just makes it easier. So I think Indeed. these things, yeah. keeping different people for different sets of jobs, making sure that you're focused on an external, you're focused on the issue through a consumer customer lens or a sustainability lens, rather than being focused on the person at hand. And third, playing the balance between experience and naivety has helped me. Um, and I would like to use one word, which I, I picked up from the net. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to say, um, and I think we, we heard the echoing of this uh, right through. Mm, yes. Um, the, the word that came to my mind was uh, man ambassadors. Man ambassadors. 
<laughs> exactly. So that's very a interesting. <laughs> that's a good say, word. You know, you know, can, right. you, can it be a man yeah. ambassador to the women? Mm -hmm. Lovely. Let's start with home, and I think you heard yeah. you heard that coming from um, from uh, Farhan too. That it starts at home. We did that's indeed. Very, very, very interesting. Absolute I, key I, I thing. Think, yes. I think those are the four or five Thank things you. that come. Thank you, Sumiji. Thank you. A great question. Um, we've got very little time left, but I do want to address a question from uh, Nagisa, who has made the point, Inclusi inclusivity also means catering to people with different life stages. So, for instance, not everyone has uh, children, for example. Can I invite to just throw it open to the panel? Just put up your hand if you'd like to make a comment about that. Um, so what, what do we think about um, uh, people in different different life cycles? Any any thoughts? Uh, Michael, this is I think Kali, yes. what is really important to answer the previous question as well as this one is let's stop doing things for people. You know, we really need to have women in the center or girl children in the center of the conversation and do things with them rather than for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that yes. if we change the conversation around that and keep their well being and what they aspire rather than what we are aspiring and having a very paternalistic traditional way of approaching things. I think the solutions are going to be quite different. And also the other point I'd like to make is we normally kind of come together and come together as usual actors. Let's get the unusual actors together. Mm -hmm. You know, those of us who are at a different stage of our journey, how are we kind of getting them into the corporate, non-corporate. I think it's really important to kind of act, but act in a way where there's a lot of rich learning. I mean, I think mm -hmm. a lot of things that we've said, we've been hearing it for years, but how do mm -hmm. we collaborate and really have more men allies to really become part of this journey. And I think many a times they're doing a much better job than probably I can do. You know, and how do we celebrate the successes that we are seeing in doing those of us who are doing things differently? So I'll stop over there. Indeed. Deepali, thank you very much indeed. I know that we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of our time now, but um, I did promise you guys the opportunity to say um, uh, one or two sentences towards the end of our session today. I'd like to do that, and to do that, I'd like to go back to Mohammed. And Mohammed, you've heard a lot of things here, um, a, a lot of things that w that we we know to be an issue. Share w share with us something that really is. What, if there's the one thing that you think we should be doing, what do you think it, it is? Four things. We will not be able to move ahead without attending to education, to media, to the cultural narrative, and to the big elephant in the room, which is the religious discourse. We need to work on these four to reach parity and to reach okay. Super. Mohammed, thank you very much indeed. Dipali, what do we really need to do? Commitment and passion to really now not wait. I mean, 2030 is around the corner. Let's rally all our forces together, do what Mohammed is, is said, but there's far more that needs to be done. Resourcing is a huge gap to get you know, our education system transformed, our health systems transformed, and really ensure that gender is mainstreamed in everything that we do. Fantastic, thank you. Srijit, what do we need to do? Well, uh, as I said, diversity is not in just what you see, it's in what you think, mm -hmm. what you feel, and how you act. Act now, if you're a man, act as an ambassador. If you're a woman, don't worry, just be yourself. The future is yours. Have the confidence, because I think the character that is required for being a good leader is all in you. Indeed. Thank you so much. Sanjeev, quick few words. Um, I'll say, I mean, definitely, um, don't, if you're a man, don't look at this as a badge. I mean, it, it is an action. Uh, so if you're a male ally, it is not a one-time thing. You Every action that you're taking every single day, whether in social settings, home settings, work settings, I mean, need to reflect I mean, the two. I mean, person you are, um, and hence, I mean, do, do your best to, to progress towards the better, more inclusive kind of environment. Terrific. Thank you, Sanjeev. Rene, over to you. What do we um, need to do? Mine, mine is to be clear on the change that you want to see and create, and then to hold yourself, your team, your organization, and your community to account on it. Fabulous. Rene, thank you. And Farhan, last but not least, what do we need to do? It starts at home and we need to be mindful as parents and we need to make sure that we take care of our, our daughters and and not uh, condition them in any other way but to be true leaders for the future. Lovely. Thank you, Farhan. And so I'm going to bring things to a con conclusion with three key things that I, I've heard so much from all of you. Thank you so much for your contributions. For me, let's start the conversation early. That's absolutely critical. Second thing is 
let's stay alert. Let's not lose the advances and, uh, that we've made as a result of COVID. So let's stay alert. And lastly, um, I think this was echoed around the table. We need to partner. We need to collaborate. We need to practice inclusive leadership ourselves because the, the, the challenge that we face with respect to this issue is huge and we're not going to be able to do it by ourselves. And I think in conclusion, um, having conferences like the one that we are so fortunate to be enjoying today is, is a great way to bring people together to try to advance the agenda in a way that it needs to be done. So I'm going to hold us to time, which is two minutes over time. Thank you, everyone. It's been such a pleasure to work with you. Thank you for all of your preparation. It's, it's, it's been terrific. So thank you. And with that, with that, I will will hand back to to Mike. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks to our outstanding moderator and panelists.